Ah, World at War. The first iteration of the Zombies mode in COD as we know it. A mode that would shape the Call of Duty community as a whole. But was World at War Zombies as good as we remember? Admittedly, a large chunk of the COD Zombies community hasn't really started with World at War. But let's take a deep dive into everything that World at War Zombies has to offer. Starting off with the first map, Nocturne Totem. Ah, Nocturne Untoten, where zombies all started. A mode unlike anything we had seen in COD up until that point. If you didn't play Call of Duty back when World at War released, then here's a brief rundown as to how it all started. You see, Zombies was not a mode that was marketed for World at War at the time. None of the pre-release marketing or even the box art included Zombies. Before the first map pack drop, you could only get Zombies by beating the main campaign. After the credits were over, you were greeted with a simple, yet effective cutscene that would set the tone perfectly. And after that, you were thrown into the map, Nocturne Toten, or Night of the Living Dead, with no clear objective other than survive. No tutorial, no anything. Given if you beat the campaign, you most likely know how to play the game pretty well, but otherwise you're left to figure it all out. Seeing my brother unlock this mode without any prior knowledge was actually kind of terrifying. While Zombies nowadays has lost a lot of the scare factor, Zombies was pretty creepy all around in World at War. You'll notice a common theme with World at War Zombies maps. They all take place in some sort of campaign or multiplayer map, with alterations of course. Knock takes place in part of the campaign mission Little Resistance, which also is part of the multiplayer map Airfield. After you spawned, zombies would start to come through the five windows in the main spawn room. All you really know what to do is kill them and survive. After each wave or round of zombies you survived, it would increase the round counter, and as such, the zombies would gain more health, meaning you would need more firepower than just your 1911 to get by. And being how it was in World at War you can only survive one hit before being killed without perks, it was a very stressful time. There were only two weapons on the walls that you could buy in the main starting room of Noct. A Car 98K for 200 points, and an M1 Carbine for 600. And while they could keep you alive in the spawn room a little bit longer, I honestly wouldn't recommend it. Your knife and the 1911 should be able to get you through the first three rounds if you play it right. Traveling through the door to your right, commonly referred to as the help door, would grant you access to another room with a strange box in it. You could also buy the spiral staircase barrier, but honestly I don't know anybody who opts for that right off the bat. The mystery box was your best shot for survival. For 950 points, you could try your luck at getting a better weapon. Sure, you could lose points and be given the car 98k, which you could buy for 200, but the box was your only surefire way to get serious firepower, like a LMG or the coveted ray gun. Also in this room was a radio, where if you shot or knifed it, it would play some music from the in-game soundtrack. You couldn't hear the music anywhere on the map, but you could see all the pieces that would become commonplace in each subsequent map. Traveling up the stairs would give you access to more running space as well as the ability to purchase a mysterious item from a cabinet. For a mere 1500 points you could get a scoped car 98k. While slightly better than the base car, it certainly wouldn't be bringing you to any high rounds. But that's pretty much the extent of the map. Two floors and a total of three purchasable doors or barriers. Most players opted to camp in the second floor near the wall by grenades until they were eventually overrun. There was also a rumored easter egg where if you got to round 100 on Noct, you would face Zombie Hitler. That turned out to be not true, so... So don't play knocked thinking you're going to get to around 100 and find something special. You're not going to get anything. So while knocked isn't the most innovative map by today's standards, it laid the perfect groundwork for what was to come. Wall buys, mystery box, music, and the five power-ups in the nuke, insta-kill, carpenter, double points, and max ammo. It's a simple map for a basic horde mode, and at the time nobody knew the impact zombies would have further down the line. 
Treyarch didn't market zombies because it was thrown in as a fun little side mode with no thought as to what the future would hold. There wasn't even really a story, it was just a horde mode. If compared to zombies maps of recent, Noct is so bare bones and doesn't offer much in terms of survivability, but at the time it felt like something special. If you're a new zombies player, I would find it very hard to recommend this map, but if you have a copy of World at War, I'd still recommend playing it, just so you can experience where zombies all started. Zombie Verrucked, the first DLC map for Call of Duty Zombies. It added a lot to the formula while still being pretty bare bones by today's standards. Verrucked directly translates to crazy in German, which makes sense as this all takes place in an asylum, also the name of the multiplayer map that it takes place in. Much like Noct, there are alterations to the original map that it takes place in. Verrucked spawns you in one of two places, with a middle doorway between you and your teammates if you have a full lobby. The power will reunite you. There is no going to the other side of that doorway without turning on the power. In both spawn rooms you can find the newest addition to COD Zombies, the Perk Machines, or Perkacola. On the left side you'll find Juggernog, which gives you extra health, allowing you to survive more hits. On the right spawn you'll find Quick Revive, allowing you to revive teammates faster. Unlike newer zombie games, Quick Revive doesn't do anything in solo, so it's a waste of 1500 points if you're solo. But in co-op it can certainly come in handy especially with the super sprinters that Ferrect introduced. Keeping with tradition, you can buy a couple weapons from the walls in each of the respective spawn rooms. Like before, they're nothing special and aren't really worth the points. This map also adds voice lines to your characters. You were still generic American soldiers, but having your character say something was a nice addition, a little foreshadowing of what's to come. Verruck's layout is basically a two-story square, filled with tight corridors and hallways all around. Not too many options for camping, and training is made difficult by the super sprinters. It's yet another simple map, but an effectively hard one. With these tight hallways, getting around incoming zombies is difficult for beginners. Again, this map is just building off of the formula for zombies, and adding new things. And building off of the creepy atmosphere in Noct, Verrucked adds some of the more ambient noises and creepy vibes. Holding the action button on this chair will play a drill sound along with someone screaming in pain. Standing over near the ovens would play a woman crying, or even a baby crying. Blood all over the walls and ground, mannequins with knives and cleavers in them, writing on the walls. Verrucked is probably one of the more creepier zombie maps out there. The difficult nature of World at War Zombies certainly helps in making this map feel tense. As mentioned previously, this was the first time that perks came into zombies. In the form of the OG4, we have Juggernog, which granted extra health. Revive Soda, which let you revive quicker, Speed Cola, which would increase your reload speed, and Double Tap, which would increase your fire rate. While future iterations of these perks would be evolved upon, the original four perks give you that extra edge that you need to survive for just a little bit longer, increasing your replay value by giving you something to work for, as well as letting you play for longer. You could gain access to these perks by turning on the power, which would also enable the two spawn sides to be reunited. Verrucked is also where we would start seeing the making of a story for zombies, with a portion of the community taking a deep look into the writings on the wall. And that's not figurative, the literal writings on the wall were picked apart by the community and it was creating a story. From dates to children's drawings and little quotes like Teddy is the biggest liar, Verrucked was starting to build a story where Noct really didn't have one. Along with the perks, Verrucked would also add a proper music easter egg this time around. Not a song from the in-game soundtrack, but a completely original making. Lullaby for a Dead Man, sung by Elena Siegman, or Siegman, I don't really know how to pronounce it, could be played by flushing a toilet three times. The beginning of this song could actually be heard at the end of the game of Noct. Most Zombies maps would actually play a snippet of the Easter Egg song from the next map once your game ends. One of the last new additions to Zombies was the mystery box moving. If you look in the power room, some writing on the wall says, Wish too often and your wishing well would run. Hitting the box too many times would cause a teddy bear to spawn, which would in turn move the box to another location. These locations could be found by looking around the map and seeing a broken mystery box in a pile of dirt, dust, and rubble, and a teddy bear would be placed on top. Once the box moves, you need to run around and find it if you want another weapon. Lastly, Verrucked added traps. For a thousand points, you could turn on the electricity traps, which would kill any nearby zombies that pass through. 
effectively cutting off areas that you wouldn't need to worry about for a short time now. Verruckt also had one of the most useless doors in Zombies history in it. For 750 points, you could purchase a door right behind Quick Revive. That room is very small and only had one entrance. You could also buy a bar with a bipod for 2500 points, which makes no sense because you can't mount bipods in Zombies. This room seems like a good spot for camping, being as Zombies can only come in one way, but it's so small that you'll easily be overwhelmed. Overall, Zombie Verruckt kept building on the Zombies formula. Every new addition of gameplay would become a staple of COD Zombies. It's innovative for the time, but by today's standards, it's still lacking. Each World at War Zombies map would improve in some way, but I wouldn't say Verruckt is a must-play. Much like Noct, if you have a copy of the game with the DLC installed, I'd say it's worth a play, but I wouldn't say you need to play the map aside from getting credit for doing so. Verruckt overall is a very fun map, but a difficult one, and with the tight corridors making it extremely difficult. And with that, we're on to the second DLC map. Shinonuma, or Swamp of Death, is the second DLC Zombies map in World at War. While not adding as much in terms of gameplay innovations as Varuk did, Shinonuma would bring forth a lot of new content and story to the Zombies universe. You could see a similar atmosphere in terms of the map design in the multiplayer map Knee Deep, which is also a DLC map in World at War. But while these maps hold a common theme, Shinonuma is mostly original as far as I can tell. Set in a jungle, the zombies you face off against will have on Japanese uniforms this time around, as opposed to the German uniforms you would see in the prior two maps. If you're not playing solo, you'll see one of the biggest additions to zombies before the game even starts, the OG crew. Consisting of Tank Dempsey, Nikolai Belensky, Takio Masaki, and Dr. Edward Richthofen, these four characters would quickly become fan favorites in the zombies games. All of these characters were just extreme characterizations of the faction that they represent. Dempsey being a super patriotic, gun-loving American, Nikolai being a drunk, aggressive Russian, Takio being a Japanese man loyal to bringing honor to his family and country, and Richthofen being an angry, power-hungry German. These four characters would be coming back map after map, and most everyone loved them. Takio being one of the most hated out of the OG4 though. His voice lines were mostly just all about honor, and I can say with certainty he was definitely my least favorite to play as in World at War. All of these players use character models that you could find in the campaign of World at War, so they're not unique creations, but their voices and personalities are. Each of these characters have a bio that you can read before the start of the game, giving insight as to who they are and where they came from. Getting into the actual map of Shinonuma, the spawn room in Shinonuma is pretty spacious all around, with a decent amount of area to run around in, but there are some shelves and whatnot in the middle that would break it up a little bit. In the spawn room, you'll also see three radios. If you interact with all of them, a mysterious voice will play, reading off various numbers before another voice comes in with a transmission, stating that they failed to contain the unit in the asylum and that they had to move the experiment here. Cutting out throughout, you'll hear various things, one of which being the giant must rise, a clue as to the next map. You'll also see someone hanging from the ceiling over in the corner. This is Peter McCain, an OSS spy sent to infiltrate group 935. You'll be hearing about them a little bit later. There are two options for leaving the spawn room, both will basically put you in the same sort of area. Leaving the spawn room brings you downstairs, to the main hub area of the map. There you'll find a few more corridors you can go into, along with the mystery box. In that mystery box is the first new wonder weapon in COD Zombies, the Wonderwaf DG2. This gun fires chains of electricity, killing hordes of zombies with a single trigger pull. One trigger pull can kill up to 10 zombies if they're close enough together. But watch out, much like the ray gun, there is some splash damage with this weapon, so don't fire it too close to you. It is the first edition of a new wonder weapon that we got, and it has infinite damage. Meaning it would be able to kill zombies with one trigger pull on any round, making it a must have for high round players here. From the main hub area, you have four branching paths that you can go in. There's the doctor's quarters, fishing hut, comm room, and storage, each with a unique layout inside. With all of these areas, you do need to walk a little bit by opening the first door until you can reach the second door where you can find the perk machines. Speaking of the perks, the four from Verruckt make a return here, this time with a little bit of a variation. 
The location of the perk machines is the same in each game. There is one perk machine in each of the four branching paths. But once you open the door to the building within these paths, the perk machines will cycle until randomly landing on one. Meaning in one game you might have Juggernaut in the comm room, and in the next it's in storage. This can make for an interesting challenge, but only because it's possible you don't get Jug until you open the last door. When opening the door to the fishing hut, you will gain access to the Flogger, a new trap in Shinonuma. This trap spins a giant log with spikes on it all around, killing zombies who cross through it and sending them flying. It's a nice addition, and the openness of that opening fishing hut area makes it a good spot to train through. The doctor's quarters hits a zipline near the building. You do have to activate it first by simply holding the interact button on it, and then it's good to go. Taking the zipline will bring you to and from the doctor's quarters back to the main hub area. Honestly, most people don't really use the zipline too often. It can be useful in a pinch if you need to quickly leave the area and can't fight through the swamp water. The comm room has the biggest training potential, with the area before the building itself being pretty open with walkways for you to go on. This is easily the main area I train through when I'm playing the map. On the inside of the comm room, there is a phone on the desk. Hitting the action button on this three times will play yet another easter egg song, once more sung by Elena Siegman. This song is called The One. Similar to Lullaby for a Dead Man, The One has lyrics that can be closely connected with zombies. The lyrics from this song are from the perspective of a zombie itself. Lyrics like, I've been waiting for someone to find me and become a part of me, and I've been waiting for you to come here and kill me and set me free, from the chorus represent the zombies want to eat and kill humans, which would in turn turn them into a zombie, and thus being part of the zombie horde. While the set me free line can represent the zombies desire to be truly dead and free from the torment of being a zombie. These two zombie songs are rock based, but not truly heavy like some of the songs we would see in the future. Quite honestly, I love pretty much every easter egg song we have in Zombies, aside from a few. The last of the four paths is the Storage Hut, probably the worst one to stay in by far. The Storage Hut offers three lanes you can go through upon entering the initial door. With not a lot of running space and the swamp water, it's easy to see why it's not a popular place to train. Speaking of swamp water, I guess I should bring that up. All around the map there is areas with water. While you are able to walk through it, it kills your momentum, and would leave you moving very slowly. Zombies are not impacted by the water, so if you find yourself in it for long periods of time, you could easily be overrun if you're not careful. Over near the storage hut, you'll find a meteor. Shooting this meteor will play a voice line from your character. You can only do this once per game. This meteor is believed to have element 115 in it, the main element used in the creation of the zombies themselves and wonder weapons like the Wonder Waff. Scattered around Shinonuma are also various radios. Interacting with them will play some transmissions, further increasing the lore and story in zombies. There's also some writing in one of the huts outside of the map that reads Tunguska, referring to the Tunguska event in which a meteor exploded in the Earth's atmosphere. While it's classified as an impact event, there was never an impact crater found during the Tunguska event. This writing led a lot of people to believe that the meteor outside of the map was the meteor from that same Tunguska event. Shinonuma really expanded on the lore of COD Zombies, but there was still more to come. Back in the gameplay side of things, Shinonuma was the first map that we saw Hellhounds in, commonly referred to as just Dog Rounds. These rounds would be coming every 5-7 to seven rounds. During these rounds, the map would become extremely foggy and only dogs would spawn, no zombies. Some of the dogs were on fire and, upon dying, would explode. Successfully completing these rounds would drop a max ammo power up. Dog rounds aren't very hard, but the speed at which they come at you can certainly make it a challenge. Most other zombie maps following this would have some sort of a special wave in which you would get a max ammo at the end of it. It's fair to say that these rounds are an integral part of the mode, and without it, it wouldn't really be the same. Much like Verruckt, the mystery box can move if used too much. This time, instead of needing to run around and find it, you can look up in the sky for a light. This light would indicate where the box was on the map. Compared to modern zombies maps, Shinonuma is pretty full of things to do, from story to the new wonder weapon and the ability to train. Shinonuma has mostly everything you would need, but not everything. It's certainly more worth playing than the first two maps, but still has a couple of missing pieces. I would recommend playing Shinonuma, 
but honestly, if you can only get it on the Black Ops 1 or Black Ops 3 versions, you're not missing out on anything else too integral aside from the weapons of those games. And with that, we're on to the final map of World of War Zombies. Oh, dear Reese, how you hold a special place in my heart. I remember staying up all night at my friend's house with some buddies waiting for this DLC to drop. We were so hyped for it. Midnight rolled around, no map released. 2 a.m., no map. And we went to bed at 7 a.m., still no map. We obviously didn't understand release times at that moment, just thought it would drop at midnight. The memories I have at this map and the wait for it go down as some of my favorite from this time in my life. But I'm getting off track here. The third and final DLC Zombies map of World at War is called Der Reese, translating to the Giant. And Giant it was. Not as giant as maps of nowadays, and compared to Shinonuma, it might be slightly smaller. But the Giant continued the Zombies evolution and brought one of the single most recognizable things to the game. Based off the multiplayer map Nightfire, Der Reese spawns you looking at a closing door, the door to the Pack-a-Punch with a voice heard saying, power level's critical, before the voice slows down and fades out. The sound of a clock ticking can be heard, with the clock on the watchtower behind you being set to 115, and the second hand keeps resetting from about 45 to 43 seconds. Going up to the pack-a-punch machine door with your character will trigger a small voice line. As zombies start to come in through the four windows of the spawn room, you're left to do what you've done in every single map thus far. Kill them all. Traveling off of the platform you spawn on gives you a pretty open spawn area. Not the most ideal for training, but it'll do for the first few rounds. A sign on the main building reads Waffenfabrik der Ries. The doors and some of the walls have Group 935 insignia. Group 935 is essentially the driving force behind all things zombies. Starting off as a research group after discovering Element 115, Group 935 is working on building functional teleporters. After trial and error, they were able to get them to work properly. Group 935 also created the Wonder Waff and the Ray Gun. Group 935 also discovered Element 115's ability to resurrect the dead. There's a whole lot I can get into about Group 935, but this is just the basics. A research group that was eventually funded by the Nazi party. That developed teleporters, weapons, and eventually, the zombies we face. This Group 935 facility is recently abandoned with broken down brick walls, a broken clock, some sandbags on the roof, reading SOS and HELP. Along with various blood splatters all around the map. Writing on the wall near the Pack-a-Punch machine reads, Embrace the Trinity and true power will be yours. Referring to linking the three teleporters up to gain access to the Pack-a-Punch machine. In one of the sewer grates, you can see a piece of paper with strange markings on it. This is a cipher. Without any prior knowledge of what to do with it, no first time player would be able to decode it. The cipher reads, Edward, it's time to kill Maxis. I won't go into depth on every cipher and piece of paper that's found in this map, but they are littered throughout, giving those people who want to know more about the story an opportunity to uncover it. A radio can also be found to the right of the stairs leading down to one of the zombie spawns. Interacting with it will play a transmission from Maxis, where he's experimenting with a zombie, giving it orders until it disobeys and someone is ordered to kill it. Group 935's plan is to control the zombies, having an undead army that they can send into battle. You have two options for leaving the spawn, one leading towards Teleporter A and one leading towards Teleporter B. Once you open the second door of these respective areas, there is a wall by it of either the Thompson on the B side or the Trench Gun on the A side. It appears to be the common consensus in the community for most people to go the Thompson route. When I first played this map, my friends and I always went the Trench Gun route. And as such, I will live by always going on that side till the day I die. You cannot convince me otherwise. Regardless of which side you choose, it'll take you three total door buys to get to the power switch. You'll notice a bridge in the middle that you cannot cross. Jumping down from the ledge you're on will bring you down to the mystery box and the power switch. Flipping on this switch turns on the power, lowering the bridge and giving you access to buy perks and the ability to start to unlock the Pack-a-Punch machine. For the most part, the starting mystery box area gives a good amount of space for running around and holding your ground for a little bit longer. It's a solid strat for the early game. Unlike Shino Numa, the perk machines will always stay in the same spot every game, so no need to worry about RNG for your perk placements. The four main machines make a return this time, and you're able to do the loose change easter egg. Not much of an easter egg by today's standards, but I'm still going to refer to it as such. 
Going prone in front of the perk machine will grant you a quarter. Well, the number you see in the yellow says 25, but you actually get between 20 and 30 points added. Dog rounds make a return in Durries. Again, occurring every 5 to 7 waves. Following you turning on the power, you can, as previously mentioned, start linking the teleporters. In each of the three labeled wings, you can open a door to find a teleporter. Interacting with the teleporter will start a timer. You must run back to the starting platform, or the mainframe, and link it up. And doing so will open the pack-a-punch door a little bit more each time. Also in each of these three wings are radios, further expanding the story of zombies. The radio on top of the wall in the A wing will play a recording of Dr. Maxis speaking to Samantha about a dog. Samantha got a dog named Fluffy, who will eventually have puppies. These dogs were eventually experimented upon and ended up being the hellhounds that we see in the game. Samantha is Dr. Maxis' daughter, but what some more modern players may not realize is Sam is basically a creation of the zombies community. You see, zombies have always made sounds, along with the basic screaming, howling, or basic zombie groans. Many people thought that they heard the zombie saying Sam. This was just meant to be another zombie groan noise, but so many people in the community thought they were hearing them say Sam, that Treyarch actually created the character of Samantha Maxis. You see, at one point in time, the COD developers did listen to us. Samantha would grow to be a driving character in the zombie storyline, but for now, all we know is Dr. Maxis has a daughter named Sam, and zombies for some reason say her name. Traveling further into the A-Wing, near a teleporter inside of a furnace, another radio can be found. Interacting with this plays a recording of a teleporter test. This teleporter test fails, and Maxis orders someone to clean it up, recalibrate, and run another test. Also in the A-Wing, there are two jars with brains and spinal cords attached to them. Interacting them will play a little noise. These are two of the three items required to play the Easter Egg song in this map. Over in the B-Wing, near the Double Tap machine, a broken brick wall of sorts reveals a Group 935 manual. Another thing for story people to dissect. The first radio in the B-Wing starts off with a dog barking. You hear Maxis tell Edward to tie the damn thing down. This is Edward Richthofen, one of the playable characters in Zombies. Another test ensues and instead of it being a failure, the test subject disappeared but didn't reappear at the mainframe. The transmission cuts out with Maxis yelling to recalibrate the system yet again. Over near the teleporter in a ladder, a radio is also found. This one beginning with a man saying, but I'm all out of hope before an alarm goes off and he ends up committing neck rope. In the background you'll hear various screaming, zombie groans, and gunshots before it cuts out. While not elaborated upon at the time, this is the voice of H. Porter, the man who created the ray gun. Over at Teleporter C in the underground area, you'll find another radio, where Maxis is recording a message to the Reichstag, where he explains his lack of funding and that the Americans have a supply of 115 in Nevada at Area 51. If Group 935 is to stay ahead of the Americans, they need to fund these experiments more. The last radio can be found by the STG Wallby, and this one's a doozy. Starting off with a test being conducted, after the teleporter you can hear a dog growl while Maxis yells at Richthofen. You can hear a hellhound spawn, and Maxis questions what it is. As the dog is heard, Samantha walks in and questions what they are doing with her dog. The dog growls and Samantha screams as she asks what he did to her. While comforting Samantha, Samantha and Maxis are locked into a room by Richthofen. Edward simply says, Goodbye, Dr. Maxis, before they're teleported away and Richthofen laughs. Again, not explained at the time, but Fluffy was teleported to the ether, spawning the Hellhounds, Maxis to the crazy place, and Samantha to the moon, at Griffin Station, where she would enter the MPD, or Moon Pyramid device. If you don't know what any of this is, don't worry. We might get into it in a later video. All you need to know right now is, Richthofen is clearly not a good person, and there's more at play here than just killing zombies and surviving. The question you may ask is, why did I spend so much time on the radios in this map, and not so much as Shino Numa, for example? That answer is simply, there is so much to unravel in Duris. While the maps of Verruckt and Shino Numa especially had story implications, Duris is where it was all starting to come together, a real proper storyline. And at the time of me first playing this map, I was hooked into what this story could be. Sure, other maps were good and had some story, but their reach was really mine and a lot of people's starting point for wanting to know even more. This wasn't simply some radios or whiting on the walls, this was bigger than all of that, and would continue to grow into something even bigger than this. Back on the gameplay side of things, like before, the box could move and the light would locate it. 
There was two new items that were added as well. The Bowie Knife, which can be purchased for 3,000 points outside of Teleporter C, and the Monkey Bombs. The Bowie Knife was, well, not really worth it. It could one-hit kill zombies up to round 11, but if you're trying to open everything up, by the time you purchase this thing, it really won't be of much use. If you have money burning a hole in your pocket, it's not the worst thing in the world, but I usually steer clear of it for the most part. The monkey bombs are as integral to zombies as the ray gun itself. Found in the mystery box, this little guy could be wound up, have his head adjusted, and thrown to distract zombies. For when you're going to be cornered, or you just need to revive a friend, or if you just need a little bit of time to breathe. The monkey bomb would take zombies away from you for a little bit before exploding, killing zombies or sometimes turning them into crawlers. As mentioned, the monkey bomb is such a huge part of the zombies mode. It's hard to think what it would be like without it. Linking all three teleporters to the mainframe would grant you access to the Pack-a-Punch machine, a staple of zombies as much as the ray gun and monkey bombs themselves. For 5,000 points, you could upgrade any weapon you had in your two slots. This would make almost any weapon viable. While your cheap wall weapons like the car would still be underpowered compared to something like the PPSH, packing your gun was always useful no matter what. It can make any weapon have a little more survival potential. When getting your upgraded weapon back, the first thing you'll notice is this badass design. White etchings all around the gun really make it stand out. While the camo is more tame compared to the animated camos of now, the World War Pack-a-Punch camo has a special place in my heart. And if we were to rank all Pack-a-Punch camos, it would probably be near the top of my list. There's something about the simplicity of it that's just really intriguing. Weapons upgraded would also be given a unique name like the MG42 tearing into the Barracuda FU all, and the PPSH turning into the Reaper. Upgraded guns would also receive some extra ammunition, along with a unique firing sound. You could still hear the bullet sounds, but now it's a little bit more sci-fi. Having an upgraded gun would also mean you could do the flytrap easter egg. The first easter egg quest in Zombies, if you can really call it that. Shooting a box outside of the map of the trench gun area will have eight objects fly into the sky. Samantha can be heard saying, Let's play a game. Let's play hide and seek. Before the items fly overhead and disappear. There are three total things you need to shoot to complete this. The first being a teddy bear holding a bowie knife above the window of the carbine wall by. A teddy bear holding a juggernaut bottle and an upgraded 1911 in a cage near the trench gun wall by. And a symbol monkey with a grenade and a molotov cocktail in the furnace near the Thompson wall by. These can be done in any order and can be shot with unupgraded guns. The first one you shoot will have Sam saying, Yay, you found one. The second one says, Wow, you found another one. And shooting the last one, Samantha will say, You win, before saying game over in an angry tone. Completing this gives you nothing more than the achievement for activating the fly trap. Also, throwing a simple monkey in the furnace will have it scream as it's being burned, and then Sam will say, Why were you so cruel to Mr. Monkey? Mr. Monkey just wanted to play. Which, for some reason, my friends and I thought this made the zombies harder, when in reality, I've pretty much just read that it increases the likelihood the power-ups drop. The flytrap is significant because it's the first proper easter egg type quest we've had in Zombies. Where previously you could find lore implications in items like radios, the flytrap had you actually trying to do something. While there is no proper reward, it still marks a significant point in Zombies history. The map Der Ries doesn't lend itself into training a ton, but it is an option if you're skilled enough. There's enough open areas for you to run through, but the main strategy was as simple as can be, the catwalk strategy. Over in the teleporter C area, you can walk up some stairs and camp on the catwalk. While not a super spacious area, the zombies can only come at you one way, funneling down this walkway to make for super easy targets. This is one of the most iconic spots in zombies. Simple, yet effective. Camping up here was not a guarantee for high rounds, but it was so simple anybody could do it. Grab your upgraded weapon of choice and mow them down as they come at you. If it starts to get dicey, you could always throw a monkey bomb or push up the catwalk and jump out of the window or the broken railing for a quick escape to regroup and reset. Camping up here was always a ton of fun. While it's super simple, it's just always a good time to see how long you can hold out. Just watch out if you have the Wonder Waff. If you pack a punch this thing and hit yourself with the splash damage, it can effectively nullify your juggernaut, making upgrading this weapon a super unpopular choice on this map. Throw on the easter egg song and you're all set up for a good time on the catwalk. Speaking of the song, I should probably finish that off. Up in the teleporter B area, you can find the final brain and spinal cord for you to interact with. Doing so will start playing Beauty of Annihilation, once again sung by Elena Siegman. 
This song is much heavier than the previous songs, with heavier guitar riffs, drums, and more screaming type vocals. This is the perfect type of song for zombies. Talking about the beauty of killing the undead and these heavy riffs just gets the adrenaline flowing. Quite honestly, this song and the future zombie songs probably helped me get into metal and metalcore genres at the time. But that's neither here nor there. Traveling around the map, you could see some low-res photos on some boards. One of the Eiffel Tower, a reference to the rumored Paris Zombies map that we will never see, and a lighthouse, foreshadowing Call of the Dead. Darice is a relatively simple layout with the three wings with each of the teleporters. The catwalk camping strategy is just as iconic as Zombies is itself. And Durris is always a ton of fun, and honestly helped make World at War one of my favorite Call of Duty games, not just for zombies. There is so much more in Durris, I could probably go on all day about this map. But all in all, Durris is the perfect ending to World at War Zombies, and it helps cement World at War Zombies as something special. World at War Zombies is something special. What started off as a side mode the devs threw in for fun, zombies would constantly evolve over the years. Each map in World at War would add and build upon the formula from the previous map, and there was no signs of stopping. Noct was a simple yet effective entrance into the mode, a small map with not a lot to do but it laid the groundwork. Verrucht, a larger map that would add perks and traps to zombies. Made difficult by the tight hallways and the sprinters, it would go down as one of the hardest zombie maps in history. Shinonuma added the Wonderwaf and started to build upon the story that the community was creating. And Dur Reese adding the Pack a Punch, Monkey Bombs, Bowie Knife, and further increasing the lore within the Zombies mode. World at War Zombies isn't the greatest in terms of gameplay, with nothing being pretty difficult because you might get stuck into a zombie and die, and the movement is a little bit slow by today's standards. But without World at War Zombies, we wouldn't have the mode that we know and love today. Is it perfect? No. But it didn't need to be and Treyarch would soon be showing us just how far they could take this mode. And with that, I'll ask you your opinion on World at War Zombies. Did you play it at the time of release, or did you come back years later just to experience where it all started? Let me know what you think in the comments down below, and we'll be continuing this conversation shortly. Thank you guys for sticking around and watching this video, and I'll see you guys in the next one. Cheerio, mates!